Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Sergei and Bernardo, for your inspiring opening address. We then secure open the seminar Modeling Complex Systems for Public Policy. I wish you all a very fruitful and insightful seminar and hope you enjoy the event. So, for our first lecture, I'm delighted to invite Professor William Rand, who will be talking about concepts, literature, possibilities, and limitations of complex systems. Professor William Rand is an assistant professor at the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. He also serves as director of the Center for Complexity in Business, the first academic research center focused solely on the application of complex systems techniques to business applications and management science. During his postdoctoral research fellowship at Northwestern University, he worked with the NetLogo development team studying agent-based modeling, evolutionary computation, and network science. Professor Rand examines the use of computational modeling techniques like agent-based modeling, geographic information systems, social network analysis, and machine learning to help understand and analyze complex systems such as the fusion of innovation, organizational learning, and economic markets. Professor Rand? Okay, the floor is yours. You can have the microphone. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I like to walk around while I talk, so I would rather not sit down if that's possible. So. Um, Thank you very much for uh, having me here. Thanks, Bernardo, very much for organizing everything. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the the great uh, introduction we just got and the great uh, kickoff that we just got. That was fantastic. Um, so yes, uh, my name is uh, Bill Rand, and I serve as the director for the Center for Complexity in Business at the University of Maryland's Robert H. Smith School of Business. Um, I'm also a professor of both marketing and computer science, which is an interesting combination to be in. Uh, and I'm going to here to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what complex systems is um, and to try and present uh, some of the thoughts as to define some terms that tell you and explain to you how you can think about some of the other talks that we'll see uh, over the next couple of days. So I want to start before I get to complex systems, I want to start with public policy because that's really the goal of, of this uh, book and of this project in many ways, is to understand how can complex systems help public policy. Uh, and the way I think about it, the goal of public policy is often to alter or maintain the behavior of a group of individuals uh, or organizations in such a way as to achieve some sort of societally beneficial outcome, right? You want, you want to place a policy in place so that you can either keep people doing the things they're doing that you like, or to change the things they're doing so that they do things better for society as a whole, right? And that's usually the goal of public policy. But the problem with that goal, right, is that individuals are very heterogeneous, right? They take different responses to the same kind of actions. If you go up to someone and tell them you can't speed anymore on the highway, Right? Some people will say, okay, I can't speed. And some people will speed even more as a result, right? And so the reactions that people take are very heterogeneous, right? How do you account for that? And the other problem is that, that those actions are not independent of each other, right? So if one person is speeding along on the highway and, when, and, and a lot of other people are moving very, very slowly, right, that affects the decisions. And if a lot of people are speeding, then that person's gonna, then the slower person's gonna speed up to catch up to the people who are speeding along, right? So these interactions, cause problems. And then what happens is that as many more and more people start to speed along the highway, right, enforcement of where you actually draw the line as to what is speeding changes, right? The police may not pull over the person only doing 10 kilometers an hour over the speed limit, and they start pulling over the people who are doing 20 and 30 and so forth, right? And so as a result, people learn that. They start speeding more, right? And so you get into all these issues of how public policy breaks down. So the way I think of it is that, you know, government's goal um, or, or, or any kind of organization involved in public policy is to issue a policy 
that is going to try and affect the decisions of a bunch of individuals or organizations, right? And they're going to try and make them do this in such a way that they ha they can predict what the outcome of those actions will be, right? Not always happy, right? Not always happy, yeah. Change some of those to frowny faces, right? Um, and But they're going to take actions, right? And these red arrows are supposed to indicate actions. And the actions all go in different directions, right? And most of these ones are at least pointing up, but at least one person's running off the bottom of the screen, right? Not doing what anyone else wants to do, right? And they talk to each other as well, right? So they see the actions of the other organizations, the other individuals. And that also affects their decision-making process, right? And we're going to use the term, and I'm going to get into it. I'm going to define it in more concrete in a little bit. But we're going to use the term emergence to define the collective product of all of those individuals, as well as the government's policy itself, right? Which results in some sort of, uh, sorry, one slide too far, results in some sort of emergent outcome. And that emergent outcome is the pattern of behavior that we actually observe, right? And I will argue that there are two primary um, aspects of all complex systems analysis that are very important. And one is trying to understand emergence, Right? And the other one is then trying to understand the feedbacks. And the feedbacks are the effect of that emergent outcome on individual decision making later on. Right? So um, to take it back to kind of a, uh, an example that's closer to one of my domain areas, right? your decision to buy a PlayStation 3 or an Xbox One is completely your own individual decision, but it's affected by what you see happening in the market. It's affected by what your friends are doing. It's affected by all sorts of other things. And so then you make a decision, right? But once you've made that decision, you've now contributed to that feedback to other individuals who are coming along later, right? And so there's very much this emergent property, market share, of which Xbox or PlayStation has the largest market share, that feeds back to affect individual decision-making at a later date, right? Um, and, in fact, I would argue in the public policy world, the other aspect is that it also affects the government, right? As, as you continue to see how these policies are changing individual behavior and how those result in emergent outcomes, that changes what government does, right? Because they see the way society is progressing and they make different statements about what the future of society should look like. Right? So that being said, so I've talked a lot about public policy, right? I haven't really talked about complex systems. Except to say that it is a system composed of many interacting parts in which the emergent outcome of the system is a product of the interactions and the feedback between that outcome and individual decision making, right? I would argue because of that framework, right, it's, it's very much a good lens to look at public policy from, right? Uh, and I'm going to use one example to kind of show you the emergent outcome. And I'm going to use this traffic jam example that's pretty classic within the space, right? So um, I actually tend to work a lot with a programming uh, software called NetLogo, which I would argue is not just for toy models, but also for more sophisticated models. But, um, and uh, it can help illustrate some of these concepts more dramatically than I can do if I just talk you through it. So. See how well I can do this one-handed? Okay. So which way am I going? Not that way. This way. Okay. So uh, here is a very simple complex systems model. Right? This one is a toy model. But, um, and in this model, right, what we have is we have a group of cars moving along a road. right? And it's, it's the simplest possible model of traffic you can think of. right? All these cars do is continue to go forward as fast as they can until they run into a car ahead of them, right? And then they have to slow down to keep from running, like literally running into the car ahead of them to keep from hitting the car, right? And so you would think that in this world, right, there's no, tra there's no um, car accidents. We actually make it so the cars can't have accidents, right? There's no, nothing to look at at the side of the road that distracts people, right? No beautiful girls walking down the side of the road, right? There, there's nothing out there to kind of provide for any reason that someone would not continue to move as fast as possible, right? And so you would think there should not be any traffic jams. But what you see within this world, right, is that even, and this has been tested actually empirically, people have done this simulation with real cars, right, that you still get traffic jams in this world, right? 
I think this is a great example of emergence, right? No one in this world wants a traffic jam to exist, right? It's not the desirable outcome. But because of the actions of many individuals, and I can rerun the model again and again and again, and you continue to get traffic jams, right? And the traffic jam is not a property of one car. One car cannot, well, one car alone cannot cause a traffic jam, right? It has to be many cars that suddenly decide to stop or slow down or as a result of the decisions around them that cause the traffic jam to happen, right? Uh, and it's that traffic jam that also feeds back to affect the decisions of the cars behind it, right? As a result of the, the, the uh, blue car slowing down here, when the red car comes around, it has to slow down, right? Then causing the cars behind it to cause a traffic jam. So I, I love this example because I think it's one of the simplest possible examples of how traffic jams. Can I change the parameters? Yeah, yeah, and you can change the parameters, right? In fact, there are, there are many. So obviously, I have a lot of I have 20 cars on this road. If I switch the cars, right, to fewer, you know, I can eventually. Well, this one still seems to have a small traffic jam, but it's not as bad, right? It actually works because it's low density. If I switch to more cars on the road, right, of course, then you're more likely to get traffic jams. If I switch how fast people can accelerate, right, then I can get different levels of traffic jams. And so you can see many, many different traffic jams fairly easy. So let me go back to the regular talk. So I think I, you know, I, I point this out as an example of a fairly easy to understand complex system that comes about quite naturally. And it's, it's amazing to me, though, how many people have this misconception that whenever they see a traffic jam, there must be a cause of the traffic jam, right? That somewhere down the road, you know, there's, there's a tree across the road or there's something like that. But reality, traffic jams naturally occur as a result of having cars on roads. It just happens. And there's nothing you can do about it. And people, and, that, and this kind of is a classic example of what that is. So let's go into these words in a little bit more detail. So what is emergence? Well, I am going to use the classic, the action is more than, uh, is, is, the action of the whole is more than the sum of the parts, right? Um, and for those of you who are interested, John Holland, who is one of my advisors, actually just came out with a small little book, these very simple introduction books that they put out, right? To complexity, and this is the very definition he uses, so I'm quoting it directly at this point. But I want to tell a little bit story about emergence that I think is really interesting, uh, that this time doesn't use a model, but a rally is a real world phenomenon, right? So in, um, in uh, around the uh, 1970s, I'd have to look back to see the exact date, uh, they installed the first high occupancy vehicle lane in North America in Washington, D.C on I-395, and I come from Washington, D.C. It's a very congested, populated city with lots of traffic, right? And so these lanes allowed you, at that time, if you had four people in the car, you could use this special lane and it made it a lot quicker to get back and forth, right? And of course, you know, here's the, this is actually a Norwegian sign, but these are the typical HOV signs that you see in this space, right? And so this seems like a, a standard public policy, right? You, I'm gonna make this decision, I'm going to try and encourage people to carpool, right? And that's my goal, right? And so they thought that when they put this policy into place, what would happen is the people who lived in the same neighborhood would get together, decide to drive in the car together, drive to the same case. Well, the interesting thing is that that happened. That did happen. But also what arose is something fairly, well, at the time, fairly unique, which was called slugging in, uh, in the D.C. area, right? Or Casual car sharing is the another word that's sometimes used for it. Essentially, these lines emerged where people would know to go to these lines if they wanted a ride to a particular place, right? And so these are complete strangers getting in line, just hopping in a car that they don't know anything about the other people driving because of the fact that they wanted to be able to use the HOV lanes in order to get through the traffic quicker, right? Um, and the truth of the matter is, is that this resulted in much faster commuting, but there was no, this was not government created. This has never been government created in any city that we know of at this point, right? Instead, it's an informal mechanism that naturally emerged as the result of a bunch of desires of individual actors to take advantage of these high occupancy vehicle lanes, right? This was something where literally the whole 
is greater than the sum of the parts, right? No individual can start to decide to do slugging, to do casual car share, right? That can't happen, right? It has to be the decision of a bunch of individuals working together to ha make this occur, right? And you can then see that this has become even more and more detailed to the point where there's now a slugging website, right, that tells you where to go to if you want to go to McLean, Virginia, versus you want to go to uh, Woodbridge, Virginia, versus wherever you want to go in the greater D.C. area. They can detail where the lanes are, where the stops are. And interestingly enough, in, our, in using complex systems as a view of public policy, this has resulted in the government actually taking action to put up signs to tell people where slugging lanes are, to tell people what to do in these contexts, right? And so it's a great example of how public policy has a direct result on emergent properties, right? And that those emergent properties can then result affect public policy. So what are feedbacks, right? So emergence is this idea that individuals can uh, take individual actions in which you result in an emergent outcome that's greater than the sum of the parts. Feedbacks are then the effects of those emergent outcomes uh, on the decisions of individuals, right? And I already kind of alluded to this example, but I love it, right? There's a number of different examples where people had to make choices between two different technologies over the years, and how did they choose between them? And, you know, you can argue that some of these have, these, some of these have been debated ad nauseum, and so I won't go into too much detail. But for instance, the choice between a QWERTY style keyboard, which is one particular layout of the keyboard, and a Dvorak style keyboard, which is another, right? It, once you make individual decisions in this place, one becomes the dominant share of use, the, in use, and that affects other people's decisions, right? Your decision to learn a Dvorak style keyboard right now, if you're using any other keyboard besides the one you happen to be, you have on your computer, is somewhat irrational because it means you can't go to another computer and easily use that computer, right? And so over time, the fact that QWERTY has become a dominant keyboard type has affected the decision that lots of other people have made in this space, right? You know, you can also talk about uh, Xbox versus PlayStation 4, right? Um, and, you know, a Big Bang reference there, too, for anyone interested. But, um, you know, <laughs> but you can, but, you know, this decision to choose one over the other right, affects other people's decisions in the future, right? If, you're, if your kids have a PlayStation 4 and the next door neighbor is deciding whether to buy a PlayStation 4 or an Xbox, chances are they're going to buy the PlayStation 4, right? So these feedbacks are complex and have lots of effects. And of course, you know, going way back, beta versus VHS, right? The same exact example. Once um, movie stores, which some of you in the audience might not even remember, but once movie TV rental stores started having... VHS tapes in high demand, beta basically disappears, right? Because no one wants to use it anymore. I don't remember. You don't remember them either. <laughs> I should use Blu-ray or something like that instead. So how do you understand these complex systems, right? That's a, that's a central question that we're going to be wrestling with over these couple of days, right? If you have complex systems, as complex as they are, with all these feedbacks and all these things going on, how can you possibly hope to understand them, right? Uh, and as Bernardo alerted, alluded to, I think one of the major ways is through modeling and simulation, right? That you try and use models and simulation to help to understand them. But I would argue that a lot of times these systems can't be very difficult to predict, to control, and to manage, right? And, and so as a result, the goal of complex systems for public policy analysis is often not a point prediction. And I think many people who think that they can get point predictions for public policy out of any type of method are somewhat deluding themselves, right? That that's, that's just simply not possible. The world is too complex to make those single point predictions in that space. Instead, I tend to embrace what uh, John Holland and John Sturman have alternatively called uh, public policy, or sorry, a simulation, a complex systems analysis as a flight simulator approach, right? So here's the idea, right? If, when we train our pilots, we don't put them right into a plane and tell them to go off and fly and see what happens, right? That would be horrible. They'd all crash and die, and that would be bad, right? Instead, what we do is we put them in a flight simulator for hours after hour after hour till they've basically covered the same exact things. Now, what they're going to see when they actually go and fly is not going to be the same as what they saw in the flight simulator, right? It's going to be different. But it's going to help them understand how the system works well enough 
that they begin can make educated and intelligent decisions in the world of, uh, in the real world, right, as opposed to in the simulator world, right? So that's the real goal of what I think of as complex systems analysis within this space. Um, and, you know, just to give you an example, this is not mine, but this is from a great group uh, based out of Santa Fe uh, by uh, Owen Densmore and Stephen Guerin that do a lot of work in um, public policy and or policy analysis of various kinds using different types of models. And this model is actually built in that logo. Um, and it's a model of something called Zozobra, which is similar to Burning Man, if any of you have ever heard of that. Um, it happens in Santa Fe every year, and apparently there's a big event at the end. And Redfish was working with the public safety officials in Santa Fe, trying to understand how they could help with um, dispersion after the event had happened, after people leaving the event, right? And so they built this model, simple model, of people moving within this space. And you can see using, a, a, this is using an agent-based model, people making their various decisions about where to go and how to leave the space. And the nice thing about this is this model was built to be interactive, so while they were running it, the public safety officials could change where barricades were and where the routes of excess, uh, exit were, so they can then see how that would affect various congestion and where they might see, right? And so this is kind of the a great example, I think, of the uh, complex systems as a flight simulator approach, right? It allows people to manipulate a potential environment. And, and you know, it's never going to happen that the actual evacuation is going to look anything like what we just saw, right? But you might, in fact, be able to understand what could potentially happen. So, for instance, I don't know how many of you will notice this, but there is a... One individual who runs straight up to the north, right? Straight up to the top of the screen, away from anyone else, right? And you might look at that and say, well, maybe there's potentially something there. Maybe there's a group of individuals who could then, as a result of this, uh, seeing this kind of an effect, could it go off in that direction. Maybe we should make sure that that direction is also okay for them to proceed, right? So what you're really trying to do in this space is you're trying to understand where the leverage points within a complex systems are, right? And so what are leverage points? Leverage points are places where the complex systems can potentially shifted from one regime to another with the least amount of effort, right? So can I provide a tax incentive to people who buy hybrid vehicles in order to cause more and more people to purchase hybrid vehicles, right? Will that be the greatest point? Or instead, should I provide a uh, a tax burden to companies that sell uh, gas guzzling cars, right? Should I provide, should I, should I put the policy in the place on the manufacturers or should I put the policy in place on the consumers, right? And that's a classic example of a leverage point analysis, right? Where in this space should I, will I get the best bang for my buck? Will I get the best uh, manipulation of what's going on, right? And this is in many ways is related to uh, tipping points, right, which is another phrase often used. And these are places where a small change in an input can dramatically affect the output. Um, and what I like to say about this is that, you know, and, and this is actually a kind of a quote from Scott Page that I don't know if he's ever written it down anywhere, which is that complex systems analysis can often tell you the most when it tells you the least. And what I mean by that is that if there is two scenarios of the world that you're trying to predict, and they're both equally likely outcomes, but one of them has a particularly desirable output over another, right? then that's a place where you can alter the system. That's a place where you can change the system. And so you can try and figure out how to manipulate that. To give you an example from some research we did while I was a grad student, right? imagine you're trying to protect an environmental area to the north of a city. right? And you keep running model after model of how urban development is going to proceed, right? If urban development seems to indicate, if the models you're running seem to indicate that development will always happen to the north of the city no matter what you do, you might be better off spending your money preventing another environmental part of, of the world, right? That might not be the best input places to where you can spend your money. However, if your models continually show that economic development, future development in that space is equally likely to happen to the north or to the south, right, 
then that indicates that you could potentially alter the path of that city, right? You could potentially place a tax incentive, for instance, for people to move to the south, right? Or you could potentially pr place a, a burden for people trying to move into the north, right? So you don't have to necessarily build a wildlife preserve, right? You could just try and alter the system through other ways, right? And to give you an example of this, right, I'm going to look at one other model, right, that I, I, another simple model of how tipping points occur. Using, oh, it's over here. Okay. Using um, a simple model of forest fires. Right. So this, again, one of the simplest possible models you can imagine. Imagine you have a big forest, right? And you want to think about how can I potentially prevent fire damage from spreading through this entire forest, right? Maybe I want to build fire break roads, right? Maybe I want to put some sort of, uh, uh, maybe I want to do some sort of uh, partial burns or something like that in order to look at what's going on, right? How can I analyze the system, right? Well, in this model, so this model is trying to represent that. And what it shows over the course of the space is every time you see a green dot, that's a tree. Every time you see a black dot, that's the lack of a tree, right? And the probability of a fire represented by this red line on the left-hand side moving from any particular tree to any other tree in this space is governed by this simple uh, rule, which just says that if they're in touch, touching to each other, if they're next to each other, then they will move next to each other, right? Then, they, then the fire will jump from one tree to another. So if two trees are adjacent, the fire will move from one tree to another. So I'm going to ask, I'm actually going to take a poll of the audience at this point, right? So I'm going to ask, right now the model is set up so that 57% of the world is covered by trees, right? More than half of the world is trees, right? Does everyone make, that make sense to everyone? Okay. And then you know the simple rule, if a red dot touches a green dot, the green dot becomes red and it catches on fire, right? That's the simple, simple rule of defining what's going on here, right? So, Here's the question. The fire is starting on the left side of the world. Imagine that, uh, you know, Brasilia or someone is, you know, an important city is here on the right side of the world. And we don't have, there are too many forests around here, but let's say Denver, Colorado, right? Or something's on the right side of the world, right? At 57% density, will the fire get from the left side of the world to the right side of the world? That's the only question. Does that make sense, everyone, what the question is? Okay. So I'm going to take a poll now. How many people think, raise your hands, how many people think, oh, let me get that real quick. How many people think that the fire will get from the left side to the right side? Okay, most people. Okay, I would say majority, right? How many people think it won't get from the left side to the right side? Oh, so a, a vocal minority, let's put it that way. Um, so let's go ahead and set up and let it run. And here goes the fire going through the place. That one's still going, still going, but it dies out, right? In fact, I can hit set up, create a brand new forest, new pattern, same density though. I can let it run again. Right? And dies out again, right? And in fact, if I run this, as many times as you possibly want me to run this, right, I can guarantee for you that for 99% of the cases in which I hit that setup button and hit the go button, it's never going to make it to the right side of the screen, right? Now I'm going to do one thing. So I said the density of the forest was 57%, right? All I'm going to do is I'm going to change the density of that forest to 62%. So I'm adding 5% more trees in the world, right? That's it. And this is a world where there are tens of thousands of trees. So, I, you know, we're talking a small increase in the number of trees out there. So now I'm going to ask the question again. How many people think that the fire will get from the left side to the right side this time? <laughs> okay, more. Does anyone think it won't get from the left side to the right side? Okay. Well, maybe I, I kind of set it up too well by talking about tipping points, right? But in fact, what you see, and it takes a while, I have confidence. <laughs> it always gets there, yeah. So almost with 100% probability, right, at this level of density, the fire almost always gets from the right, from the uh, right side of the screen to the left side of the screen. 
right? And all we did was increase one input variable by a small amount, right? By by one, by, all, by less than one tenth of its original value, right? So that's a small increase, right? And yet we get this huge increase. In fact, I mean, the other thing you can look at is this percent burned, right? And the percent burned goes from you know 30, 40 at most to 88, 90 percent of the forest, right? So this is what I mean when I talk about a tipping point. A small change in the input creates a dramatic change in the output. I'll let it run again as I'm seeing this set up. And what we want to find is we want to find those areas. We want to find those places and figure out how we can alter the system. So we want to, for instance, if it's this case and we want to prevent forest fires, how do we alter the system to move it down in such a way um, to decrease the probability of that being a dangerous thing? So maybe we build forest breaks, right, that decrease the amount of space there. Okay. So this is related to a concept that is known as path dependence, right, which is another concept that's very critical in complex systems analysis. And path dependence, you know, the simple definition that I'm going to use is when the current possibilities, the current choices you have are limited by past choices that you've made or past events that have occurred, right? And so the example that we often use, and this is quite, this is work from my graduate school days, right, and it's perfect, is in fact urban development, right, and policies affecting urban development. So what you see up there in the, in the upper left corner is a map of southeastern Michigan near Detroit, actually near, it's Washtenaw County, which is near where, which is where the University of Michigan is. Um, and so it's in Ann Arbor, Michigan, yeah. And so Ann Arbor's um, the big density point that you can see right in the middle of it, right there, right, so right about there. So what we did with an agent-based model was uh, we ran it many, many times to try and predict development patterns of the actual, what would, uh, uh, of the, what the development would look like in the future in that area, in Washtenaw County, right? And what we found, right, and so this is the, what it actually eventually wound up looking like. This is the, so we, we tested our model by running it many times in the past and then seeing if we could predict the current state of the world, right? And then from there, we would run it again in the future and see what would happen, right? And what we found, if you looked at it, um, is that we got a pretty good map. So this is the actual, the reference map is the actual real world. This is one realization of our model, right, one particular instance of our model. This shows the frequency with which various parts of the world became developed. And this shows what we call the variant-invariant region, which was a term we came up with to describe what parts of the world does the model think will always be developed, and what parts of the world does it think will never be developed, and what parts may or may not be developed. So if, to read this, white is areas that will never be developed, black is areas that will always be developed, and gray is areas that might be developed, right? And the reason why I put this in the path-dependent slide, and the reason why I'm talking about this in the context of path-dependent, is that urban development is one of those things that's very path-dependent, right? So when you start to see a small development down here, which is actually near Jackson, Michigan, a small town outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan, actually a decent-sized town, right? That development can either continue to explode or continue not to explode based upon how many people are living there at the time, right? And what we found in this case is that our model actually fairly accurately predicted that, right? But it also predicted, or seemed to predict, that there was going to be this development down here, which is a, small, a smaller town that never actually took off, right? And the reason why, it might be happenstance, but for some reason people decided to move more towards the Ann Arbor area and to the Jackson area rather than this small town right here, right? And that's a classic example of a path-dependent process. It could really become a major metropolitan area, but because of some, a few small decisions early on, there weren't enough density there to uh, provide enough support for it to become a metropolitan area or more, a more urban area. Path dependence is also related to another concept we often talk about within uh, complex systems, which is sensitivity to initial conditions. Right? And um, the strong form of this is sometimes called the butterfly effect. Right, which says that if a butterfly flaps its wings in China, you get rain instead of uh, sun in Topeka, Kansas, right, or however you want to phrase it. Right? And in the strong form, this is actually a condition of what's known as a chaotic system, right, uh, which says that every starting point is arbitrarily close to another starting point, 
with a significantly different future, right? Um, and Edward Lorenz, who did a lot of the work in this area, <laughs> another reason why it's called the butterfly effect is because of the look of this famous graph that he generated that looks like a butterfly, right? Um, he said, the way he describes it is when the present determines the future. In other words, <coughs> what we're doing right now determines what will happen in the future. But the problem is that the approximate present doesn't determine the approximate future. In other words, if things were slightly different than right now, then the future might be very, very different instead of very similar, right? Um, and that's a chaotic system. Now, not all complex systems are chaotic. In fact, many of them are, not, are, are, are robust and are not chaotic, right? That, they, that small changes in the inputs will actually result in the same future, right? Um, but in general, a lot of uh, complex systems do feature um, the fact that where you start, and I'll call this the weak form of sensitivity to initial conditions, where you start matters, right? And you can't get to the same place regardless of where you start, right? Um, that's very different than the, than the strong form from chaos, but, you know, nonetheless, an important concept to keep in mind. And, of course, as uh, Bernardo already alluded to, right, there, as a result of a lot of these different factors working together, sensitivity to initial conditions, path dependence, things like that, we often see systems that feature nonlinearity in their results, right? And this means that you could be putting a lot of effort into something, and all of a sudden, you're not seeing any change, any change, any change, and just you put that smallest amount of additional effort, and a huge change occurs, right? And that's a nonlinear transition, right? You've gone through something where a little bit of additional effort has been enough to push you over the edge. The fire model is actually a nonlinear system, right? A small change in the amount of effort you put in changes, or the amount, of, the way the trees are set up, changes the outcome of the system as a whole, right? And nonlinear can also happen because there are interactions between different parts of the system, right, that cause nonlinear effects to occur, right? Um, so, for instance, I'm at, I, I'll describe this rather than illustrate, but um, I'm, Bill, I work a lot with social media and try to understand how social media affects company decision making and how company decision making should generate social media content, right? And what we've found is that there's some very nonlinear systems at play in this space, right? One of the ones I'll give you a quick example of is that if a company uh, were to observe a crisis, so for instance, um, a, couple of, a couple of months ago, General Mills actually issued a statement saying that if you liked them on Facebook, it would cause you to be submitted to uh, mandatory arbitration within the General Mills framework, right? So you can no longer sue General Mills. You would have to go through an arbitrator, right? This decision by General Mills to do that caused an outroar on social media, right? An outroar on social media because people were really upset. They wanted to be able to interact with General Mills via social media and not, cause, and not have this repercussion of uh, having to no longer giving up the right to sue General Mills. That outroar on social media caused the New York Times to write an article about what is happening, right? As a result, General Mills rescinded this policy of what was going on, right? This is an example of nonlinearity because there was a number of different policies that had to happen, a number of different interactions that happened to happen in the right order in order for the effect to occur, right? Not all social media outcries cause companies to change their decisions, right? Not all social media outcries cause the New York Times to write an out, out article, right? Not all New York Times articles cause in the, the company to change its policy. But only as a result of all these things happening at the same time do you see a change that would happen, right? And that's kind of a different type of nonlinear. That's a nonlinear as a result of multiple interacting elements. But I want to quickly show you an example of nonlinearity that's a little simpler to understand. So... So this is a model called the giant component model. And actually, the theory for this goes way back to um, the 1950s and 1960s and some of the graph theory work that was done by people like Paul Erdos and Renyi and people like those. Um, but, um, but the model is kind of cool because basically what it shows, let's imagine that you're trying to get people to talk about a subject, right? 
uh, and that you want them to talk together, right? You don't want them to necessarily, so maybe it's some sort of public education statement like anti-smoking or wearing your seatbelt or something along those lines, right? Um, and you kind of push a little bit, push a little bit every time trying to get people to talk. And as they continue to do that, you try and observe how many people have talked to how many other people about what's going on, right? And so in this world, what you'll see is that, you know, basically we've convinced these two people to talk to each other, right? And now we've convinced these two people to talk to each other. So at each step, we're convincing a couple of people to talk to each other. But as you can see, when we do this kind of just push, push, push a little bit at a time, we get all these separate isolate communities in the space, right? But if we let it run for a while, over time, and so we're going to use the red marker to indicate the largest group of individuals who are talking to each other in the space, right? And right now the red group is not very big, right? But as we continue to push, continue to push, we quickly reach a point where this, the red group starts to become the largest group. It starts to encompass most of the individuals who are in the community, right? And in fact, it turns out that this, this point at which this transition happens is fairly well defined as the number of connections between individuals um, it exceeds, on average, one, right, then the giant component quickly forms. Um, it turns out it's a lot more complicated to tell you when it gets closer and closer to one, but that's uh, uh, it's a not a closed form solution. But, but, the, but you get these giant components quickly occurring, right? So you have a nonlinear effect as a result of the simple process occurring, right? So the argument, that, you know, kind of the piece to take away from this for something like public policy, word of mouth spread, which is something I study a lot, is that often, right when you need to, when you think you should give up because you've put so much effort in, is when you need to put just that little bit more effort in in order to cause it to spin over to the next level. Okay. Yeah. What? It's a big party, yeah. So, of course, one other thing you might want to talk about is how robust is the policy we're putting into effect to these nonlinear effects, to sensitivity to initial conditions, to path dependence, right? And robustness is when a system maintains its characteristic behavior even after a small perturbation away from it, or even a larger perturbation, depending upon your test, right? So I was out walking around uh, the other day after Bernardo picked me up from the airport, and I went up to the TV tower and I took this picture right, of Brasilia, right, and Brasilia seems like, you know, it's a city that was elegantly planned, really thought out, right, and as a result seems fairly robust to perturbations, to changes within the system. Now, you know, I know that some people think that maybe it doesn't work as well as it should and things like that, but, you know, it, it is still functioning, it's still exhibiting its characteristic behavior the way it was originally planned to do, right. And the point I want to make is that this happens even despite small changes in, in the way the system was set up, right? So you can have broken benches, you can have other things that aren't working exactly the way they should, and yet the system as a whole still functions, right? The, the, the behavior of the system still operates despite those changes, right? And, but I want to argue that robustness is not always a good thing. This model is actually a model from um, Bob Axelrod at the University of Michigan, of ethnocentrism, right, and the development of ethnocentrism. In other words, the, the, the fact that people like to help people who are similar to them, but betray people who are different than them, right? This is the way kind of that Bob defines ethnocentrism in the space. And we can actually show that this model of ethnocentrism is not very robust, or is very robust, sorry, to lots of changes in the system, right? Oh, shoot. So here's the model. What you're looking at is the red line. The red line indicates the number of people who cooperate with people like themselves but defect against people who are different than themselves, right? And the red line in this model always wins for a large variety of conditions. And we can do things like change you know, how much does it cost me to help out someone else, right? And even when we change that cost ratio, well, in this case, actually, if we change that cost too much, what happens is people hate everybody, <laughs> right? So defect, defect is a solution. No one cooperates with anyone. But if we change the gain, 
what the benefit of being similar to someone else is, what you'll see is this cooperate, cooperate, which is the solution we'd like to see in most public policy. People are nice to each other, starts to do well, but then winds up trading off with the cooperate defect, the ethnocentrism solution. And the, the takeaway from this is just that there are, there's a large range of parameters for which we can affect this system for which ethnocentrism is inevitable, right? And that means, in fact, that means that if systems continue to operate without intervention, they're almost inevitably going to that space, right? But what this doesn't have is this doesn't have public policy in it, right? There's no public policy in this model. There's nothing to encourage people to cooperate with each other. There's nothing to encourage people not to defect against each other, right? And so I would argue that in many ways this model is, a, is an argument for public policy to intervene in this space. And as course, as uh, Bernardo mentioned, as overview, you know, a big point of all of this is diversity and heterogeneity, right? One of the things that the ethnocentrism model figures out shows is that there are diverse communities, and those diverse communities, their their needs and their requirements need to be respected, right? Um, and a lot of systems won't even work without diversity, right? So take it down to the honeybees example, right? Honeybees cool their hive by flapping their wings, but if all of them decided to start flapping their wings when the temperature got to the exact same level, you'd have this thermostat effect where they flap and it goes down, you know, it decreases the temperature and then it gets too cold and they flap in a different way to go up and then keep bouncing back and forth. So instead, honeybees have a natural diversity of their decision to flap or not flap based upon a random chance and various gene attributes. As a result of that, they, different ones will come in at different places causing a gradual change within the overall system. Right? Another example is standing ovations. Standing ovations would not occur if everyone had the same threshold for when to stand or not stand. Right? It's the fact that we have different thresholds to decide to stand, to clap, or not stand that cause standing ovations to occur because we see a couple of people who may have a th lower threshold standing, and as a result, we're influenced by peer pressure to stand as well, and we continue to stand. And interconnectedness, obviously a big aspect of what's going on and continuing to become a more important aspect. Hyperconnectedness, a great example. I study a lot of Twitter data, for instance, right? Um, and this is examples of the Bin Laden retweet network. So when Bin Laden was captured and killed, people talking about it. The Hurricane Sandy retweet network from the East Coast of the United States. And the United States 2012 presidential election retweet network. And so using complex systems analysis, we can start to trace the paths of where those, where those connections happen and how they move on. And here's kind of a quick little model that we built using an agent-based model showing the diffusion of a particular idea through the space um, and showing um, how people decided to adopt um, an idea within this space. So you can assume, for instance, that this is uh, you know, some sort of uh, public service idea you're trying to progress again. For instance, uh, you know, that people should put more in savings or something along those lines in order to encourage the adoption within that space. And the takeaway from this model and the result from this model, which was previously published, was that it doesn't necessarily make sense to try and broadcast your message to uh, people who have lots and lots of friends because those people tend to be at the center of a cluster and instead it makes more sense to reach out to different clusters within the space. So once you understand the connected nature of the system, you can start to think better about how the system should work. I'm not going to talk too much about tools of complex systems because uh, Miguel is talking about that later, right? And uh, but I just want to mention that you know a lot of the tools that I point out, and I've talked about agent-based modeling, I've talked about network science, system dynamics, um, need to be complemented by traditional tools such as statistical knowledge, analysis, psychological experiments, etc. And one of the points of these tools is they all help us to build results that are generalizable. In other words, results that make sense beyond just the particular problem that we're studying right now. Right? And this is sometimes called universality. It's the notion that's often referred to. I tend to be a little more humble in my claims and call them generalizable instead of universal. But you know, the, the idea is that they go beyond just the particular phenomenon. And the goal of complex systems, in many ways, is to build that language such that we can use the same language to talk about different problems out there. 
And there are five chapters in this book about different applications, so I won't tell you about that, but, but the truth of the matter is, is that complex systems has already been applied in any number of different areas. Disaster management, tourism, medicine, biology, etc. What about volume two and three? Yeah, exactly. You could go on and make volume after volume of just areas where this has been applied, right? Finally, I want to wrap up by kind of talking about the advantages, the limitations uh, of complex systems analysis and some of the resistance that's out there to complex systems, right? Um, so I put together this slide. This is actually um, some work. Actually, I'm writing a textbook on agent-based modeling, and this is some of the same thoughts that inspired that textbook. When is complex systems useful, right? And I can't take full credit for the first one. That's actually a paper by a guy named John Casty on seeing the light at L for all. Um, he argues that a lot of times complex systems analysis is most useful when looking at medium numbers of individuals, right? And what he means by that is not a single individual, right? You don't want to model a single individual. Complex systems is usually not very useful there because there's no interactions when modeling a single individual, right? You don't want to model millions, or, or sorry, potentially billions of individuals who are well approximated by their, by their statistical properties, right? So if you have a lot, a lot of individuals, right, then interconnectedness doesn't matter again necessarily because everyone acts pretty much like everyone else on the average, right? Now, there are definitely cases where that's not the case, right? If you talk about things like airplane networks, for instance, everyone, even though there's millions of people in those networks, they're all driven through a forced area where there's small concentrations of them that can vastly affect the outcome, right? So this, these are all guidelines and not necessarily results. Complex but local interactions is often where complex systems works out well. So memory dependent interactions and interactions that might depend upon the history of the interactions between the individuals. And systems where there's heterogeneity among the agents where they have different properties. Systems where they operate in rich environments. Systems where there's a lot of time to take account of, right? And uh, systems in which there's adaptation within the system. And you know, complex systems basically can let you account for this. It can let you account for multiple scales, for heterogeneity, for all these different things. Um, and one particular aspect that I've been pointing out recently um, within the public policy realm especially might be interesting is the potential to overcome the Lucas critique. So those of you who are familiar, the Lucas critique basically says that a lot of our models are, um, uh, uh, are um, macro models of economics policies and things like that are flawed because they assume that individuals will continue to operate the same way they will even after we change the policy, and that's not the case, right? But with agent-based modeling, with adaptive modeling, we can kind of build reactions of the individuals in, right? And we might not necessarily get it right, but we can at least try to build that into it. And of course, you know, complex systems, we can build things within networks. We can build things in real-world cities. This is actually a project in SimCity, but it was work that we were doing on urban planning where we used SimCity to visualize what we were doing in it. So um, it's very interesting. One of the other advantages I would argue for complex systems is it gives you the ability to communicate results in new and powerful ways, right? So um, this is the Anasazi model. It was built uh, at the Santa Fe Institute with a number of different people, right? But it's very interesting. This is a model of, yeah, it's an anthropological model looking at how the Anasazi population and Native American population died out, right? Um, and this graphic allows you to look at that data in a much more different way, right, than if you were to simply just say, oh, it's a problem of water or it's a problem of society, right? Because you can watch in a, the system evolving, right? This is a model of school choice uh, from Chicago, actually done at Northwestern with uh, Eitan Bakshi, Spira Marulo, Sari Walensky, and a number of others. Right? And it allows you to quickly see how are students choosing to go from one school to another within the space. And one of the nice things is that you can quickly see patterns that start to emerge from these visualizations. Right? And these visualizations would not be possible without complex systems. And this is a model that I actually built to look at the effects of different competing market forces on the spread of information within a social network, right? And here all I'm showing is that by having some measures on the x-axis and some measures on the y-axis and running a bunch of different simulations, we can explore the total space and look for robust solutions that might exactly work, even if our assumptions about the individual parameters are not correct, right? And that's something complex systems now, so a lot of methods actually provide that. But it's something that complex systems analysis naturally gives to you. 
I would argue there are some limitations, some of which have been mentioned, you know, high computational cost to complex systems, right? There's a lot of free parameters within complex systems. Um, but a lot of these things, I would argue also that computational costs, first of all, computers are becoming cheaper, right? So it's not as big of a problem. Second, it's that exact computational cost that gives us more insight, so it's a trade-off. Um, many free parameters. Well, a lot of equation-based models make assumptions that aren't completely explicit, right? And so a lot of times when we're using a computational approach, we're making that explicit, uh, we're making that assumption explicit. And it may require individual level knowledge. All the things I've talked about are individual level decisions, which uh, may or may not necessarily be something that you know about. You might not know how people make those decisions, right? But it's the fact that you've studied and understood how people make those decisions that directly relates to your ability to then make more complex uh, foresight and decisions uh, based upon the overall complex system now. So why is there resistance to complex systems, right? Um, well, I would argue for a number of reasons. I would argue, first of all, there's just lack of education. People don't, you know, people who are trained in econometric modeling don't know how to build a computer model necessarily, right? And so some of it is that we need to revise our educational curricula within graduate schools and undergraduate schools in order to train people better in complex systems methods, right? And I, I know that Michael will be talking definitely about that at some point in the future, so I, I will leave that mainly for him. But the other thing I would argue is the story of the drunk, the keys, and the light post, right? You know, the story goes that a man finds a drunk man wandering around looking for his keys underneath a street light. And he asks him, why are you looking for your keys here, right? Is this where you drop them? And he's like, no, but it's the only place where I can actually see, right? Uh, and so the point is that we often use modeling frameworks that we constrain our vision of the world because it's the only place where we know how to solve the problem, right? Complex systems analysis allows us to go beyond that. Right? allows us to move beyond that space, but it means you have to learn something new. It means you have to learn new effort. It means you have to take out that flashlight and start looking around rather than just looking underneath the street light. Right? And so because of that additional effort, right, people are often resistant to complex systems now. Finally, and this is actually based upon psychological research back in the 1990s, uh, Mitch Resnick and Ernie Olensky did a series of studies where they basically showed that even from a young age, we're imprinted with the idea of what they call a centralized and deterministic mindset. In other words, we believe that there must always be a central leader, and we believe that everything happens for a reason, that there's a deterministic cause for what happens, right? But in reality, we know that's not the case, right? In reality, we know that there's often decentralized things that occur, and that there's randomness that still results in the same patterns of behavior, right? So the example I often like to use and I will basically, this will be my last model I show and then I'll wrap up, is uh, flocking birds, right? And so <laughs> Bernardo mentioned. So um, these are murmurations of starlings, actually, and they create these gigantic, very dramatic patterns of behavior, right? And so people have often said, well, this must be the result of some centralized bird. There must be some bird leader who makes the decision about how they move and how, where they go and things like that. But the truth is there isn't. There's no... There's no centralized leader, right, in the space. It's just a merging outcome of the results of many birds making individual decisions. Right? And the other aspect is that you might think that there is um, a, a determinism, that the, that the birds always move in the same way, but that's not true either. It turns out that they make slight changes, but the result is still these emergent, beautiful patterns of behavior. Right? So to go over here and show you guys one last model. If I can find my cursor, there it is. We can simulate these patterns fairly easily within agent-based modeling. And this actually is a model called the Boyd's model, originally developed by Craig Reynolds, uh, wound up actually winning an Academy Award for partially for the work that it inspired on the, one of the Batman movies and simulating how Batman, uh, the bats moved within the city, right? Um, but essentially, these birds all started off heading in random directions and following three simple rules. And those three simple rules were Try to align yourself heading in the direction of people nearby you. Try and move closer to the center of people nearby you. And don't run into another bird, right? And those are the only rules that exist within that system. And yet, as a result of that, you get these beautiful patterns of flocking-like behavior that occur no matter how I set up the model, no matter how many times I run it. And it continues to persist. I can speed it up a little bit so you can see. 
So um, with that, let me just go back to one last conclusion slide. Yeah, there we go. So I want to I just conclude with this kind of brief story. So um, I'm a big fan of science fiction. I like to read a lot of science fiction. And there's a series of books by Isaac Asimov called The Foundation Series. And in The Foundation Series, um, there's, a, there's, an, there's a character known as Harry Seldon. And Harry Seldon uses a technique known as psychohistory. And psychohistory is this fictional science made up of statistics, history, and sociology to essentially try to predict the movement of large groups of individuals over time, right? And I would argue in many ways that complex systems, the goal of a lot of times, especially within the realm of public policy, is something similar. I have a large group of individuals. I want to create a policy such that I can forecast how individuals will move. Now, within, the Harry, within Isaac Asimov's foundation series, Harry Sullivan doesn't always get it right. He creates backup plans along the way that can help us to change things and fix things when they go slightly off course. And I would argue that complex systems should, uh, analysis of public policy should have the same framework, right? It should assume that things are not going to happen what we're, the way we intend for them to happen, right? But together with these kind of notions and together with understanding and embracing uncertainty, right, we can start to develop kind of a complex systems type of framework uh, for uh, understanding and, and working with public policy. Uh, so with that, I'd just like to thank everyone again for your attention. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, my email, my Twitter handle, and my website are up there. Um, and just quick mention that we have a conference every year on complex systems for business and management science in downtown DC. Uh, the deadline for abstracts was yesterday, but if you send me one, I'll get it in. So <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much for everything. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you for a very inspiring, uh, very good uh, presentation. Hopefully, what uh, it was in tune with my presentation. So, so far, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, let's yeah. Go. No, you're great. Uh, before we continue, I'd like to invite our discussants for this section. I'd like to invite uh, Miguel Fuentes, please. Uh, Miguel Fuentes is from the Santa Fe Institute. We'll talk more about, uh, yes, please, uh, his curriculum later when he talks, and I'd also like to invite Bernardo Miller from the University of Brasilia to your comments. How much time do we have, Bernardo? Uh, we have about one hour of debate, so we do uh, have some time. I think that maybe if you can take like 15 minutes and then uh, Bernard more 15 minutes, yeah. but uh, it's open for debate. <laughs> I would like to have some questions from the audience, but afterwards. So, and then I'd like to give you the floor first because we got here too late last night. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would like to thank Bernardo and all the organization uh, for the invitation. The person that is behind the scene, thank you very much for all the emails and the right men. Uh, well. Um, Very nice presentation, actually very nice introduction, and very nice presentation for William. And I would like to point out uh, a few things. Uh, tomorrow I will be discussing the methods and methodologies of complex system, and it will be a little bit technical. I will try to go to the public uh, policies um, arena. Uh, and a few comments about William talk. Uh, one that I think is very crucial is trying to understand this uh, non-linearity that uh, appears in complex system, and I think in in social science uh, as a whole, uh, this idea of uh, small changes that can produce uh, very big uh, and sudden unexpected changes in in the emergent behavior. Um, also, I would like to point out uh, a few things on sensitivity to initial condition. That was something that William also mentioned. Um, that is a, a very important characteristic also in nonlinear system, uh, and system that also has uh, chaotic behavior. This is one of the characteristics of the cha uh, chaotic behavior in nonlinear systems. And again, I think in public, uh, public poli policy, this should be uh, one very, very important point to be aware of. 
that uh, is not the same uh, where we begin a such policy uh, and what are the initial conditions for that. So probably a very good idea in a very bad time to do it, you know, will we'll go to a very different uh, final behavior. Uh, and I think this is the, case, uh, the historical case uh, that happened with many good ideas that I, at least I, 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 I saw in, in public policy because sometimes a very good idea is, is uh, wasted because it's not the right time to do it. Um, another thing of diversity and uh, heterogeneity that that is also a uh, the classical example where complex system can be applied, and I think this is the case also in social system analysis and most probably in public policy. Uh, and, and also I would like to uh, introduce the idea of uh, where we can have a very different uh, approach but also very similar uh, with complex system, and that is the idea of the number of agents that is uh, in in the system we are looking at. And I came from a statistical mechanics. This is my 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 uh, background, and we have an overlap and an, an overlapping uh, sometimes behavior between complex system and the system that we can treat with a uh, statistical mechanic. And basic, basically is the, the idea is that when you have a lot of agents, I mean a lot, you can apply it, uh, a statistical mechanics. And the final remarks of William is very interesting because uh, there is one guy that is associated with the uh, Santa Fe Institute uh, that is doing exactly what he mentioned at the end, you know, like like a, a metaphor, like a joke or something like that of Harry Seldon and the foundation uh, is, uh, history. And this guy, Peter Churchin, is trying to build what is called historical or uh, historical dynamics. So you can imagine you have a, a scenario with uh, for a given population, a given society, and you have the data of the initial condition, you have the data of the environment, you have the data of uh, how many energy they have. Uh, you can construct with all this data uh, a very good kind of dynamical system and you can see where the system will go. And in this way, you can predict, for example, the uh, the fall of a given empire, for example, the Roman Empire, or what happened with the Maya here in, in in Central America, because you can see that these guys are, for example, for for the Maya, uh, the problem was the water resource, so they build a complete and huge empire, but without knowing that they they have this very uh, resource uh, that is uh, that it was very small in in, in, in the place where they live uh, nowadays we can build a very uh, good models to more or less with 100 percent sure that we will know that this this society will collapse and and I think this is the case for many cities that we see now that we know what will happen if we do not change some behaviors transport behavior, uh, how uh, the education patterns are, and how how we build the, the, um, the neighborhood. And I will give a few examples of that, where with, um, for example, with um, uh, qualitative models using, for example, pattern formation models, we can predict where the uh, violence um, um, where we will have some violence uh, effects in, in given cities. Uh, particularly, this, this was constructed to, to study what's happening in, in Eastern Europe, in, near Bosnia and, and Montenegro. So I think now, uh, I will, uh, you know, I will stop a little bit now, probably I will, I will uh, give the, the, the word 
uh, to the next one. Uh, but I would like to uh, finish saying thank you for this great opportunity. Uh, you know, I will, I will, I think I will learn a lot from all the speakers. So thank you again, Bernardo. Uh, thank you very much, Miguel. Uh, I was, uh, he was talking, I was just uh, thinking here that, uh, of course, Bill talked a lot about a lot of concepts. And for our first viewer, Bill, I don't think it's easy to capture so much. So uh, we are going to try to make available all the presentations, and uh, we are going to put up the YouTube of the video of the presentations. But mainly, I think you have to read, right? So everybody's do doing this talk based on a chapter, and then we can see the concepts and read them like 10 times. Uh, Miguel just mentioned super statistics, so I'm not sure this is a familiar name for everybody. But then again, you get into detail, and then you have to read the chapter, and then you have to read five more chapters, and then you can get a, a, a grasp of what we're talking about. And, so, and there's also a bunch of references within of the course. chapters, and I try to, at least in the introductory chapter, point out ones that are kind of gentle, gentle introductions to yes. complexities. So. Uh, Claudio Tessoni, there is 105 references in the preliminary chapter. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking into the... Yeah. <laughs> So that's the idea, right? To have a paved way for the reader to yeah. find himself. So thank you, Miguel. Uh, Bernardo, please, your comments. Okay, um, so first of all, I want to congratulate Ipea and Bernardo for doing, for doing this, for setting this up. Uh, I, I think th this, this um, meeting can actually be quite historic in this following sense. There's, there's this film about it's called it's called 24 hour party people it, so it's, it's a half documentary it's about um how punk rock arose and there's this scene which is i think it it, it, it resem resembles this a little bit to me it's it's a scene where the sex pistols are happening punk rock starting out there's this new thing happening sex pistols punk rock people have heard about this maybe somewhere and then they go to play in manchester which will eventually become one of the punk rock centers. So they're, at, they're in Manchester, and a place it's sort of like this, actually, in the film, sort of like a smallish theater. And the Sex Pistols are on stage, and they're playing, and nobody ever heard this kind of music, never seen that kind of clothes and those kinds of attitudes before. And then at, at a certain point, the camera freezes with the band on stage, and then the camera turns around to the public. And you see all these empty seats. There's about 30 people in a place that fits 500 people. And then, and then the, the, the narrating voice goes, so, well, let's see who these people are. And so they stop on one guy and says, well, this guy, in three years' time, he's going to make this band. And some, that guy right there, he's going to become a famous producer. And all these, so, so all these people, these 30 people are being highly influenced. They're being infected by this thing that, that's happening. And they're going on to change the world. And so maybe I hope that this, this, this is what Martin was striving for. All of you. <laughs> I'm planning to start the Ramones of complex systems myself. But. <laughs> Actually, they're here. <laughs> okay. They're here. They're here right now. Yeah. Wow. Well, the, the, the only guy who's left is here. <laughs> who's not dead. <laughs> okay. So, um, I, so I, I think that the, the, I really enjoyed the talk. The th talk was very important. And as Bernardo said, this is the kind of thing where you have to keep um, – there's all these different concepts – and, and it, it's, it's necessary for people to hear these things and hear many times. That it, repetition is important on, on these things. I, I teach a course in complex system at the University of Brasilia here, and I, I, I taught it once at the undergrad level, and, and a really big classroom appeared, 50 students. This year I taught it at, at graduate course level, and I got three people showing up. So you, you never really know. Um, and, and you can understand this, this idea that there's, the, there's a resistance to a new approach. This, this, is, um, this is something that, that, that one of the reasons why it's very courageous to, to set up this thing. There always will be resistance. People have, have you know, they've, 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 there's a path dependent. They've studied economics or, or biology, and they have the tools, and it took so long to get where they are, and now you're saying, well, here's something else. And, and you should learn this, you should do this, and, and, you're, and a lot of the stuff you're doing, you're, gonna, you're not going to need that anymore. And, and naturally, there's a lot of, a lot of resistance to that. Um, what, one of the things um, I, I would ask you to comment on, which, is, which always arises, I think, when people start learning about, about complex systems, is 
it, it's, it's very transdisciplinary. There's physicists, and there's biology, and there's computer science, and then there's social science. And when you give these, these models and these, you'll, you'll talk about birds, and then there's ants and fishes, and the brain, and cities, and immune systems. But to what, to what it, and, and then, like you're saying, well, public policy is like these things. It's, it's an analogy, right? The, the brain, the public policy is like the brain. It's like an anthill. And it makes sense when you start thinking of it. But to what extent are these things analogies, really? Or, because it, 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 it's very subtle, right? Or to, or, or is public policy like an anthill? Or are, are the, these, char these fundamental characteristics? So I'll ask you if, if you can say something about that. Um, one of the things, uh, another thing I'll ask you to talk about, which is I, I'm an economist, and, and for, for us economists, to think of a, you know, you'll, you'll start telling an economist about complex systems, oh, yeah, that's cool, that's cool. But then when he realizes that there's no equilibrium, right, <laughs> that equilibrium is not the goal, that's not, because that, that's the way we were raised. That's the way we go to grad school and for years, years, that's what you do, that, that's what the exams are. They give you equations, find the equilibrium and draw a little box around it. So that, and then all of a sudden, the complex system, and there's no real equilibrium, there's just these attractors, that, but we never get there. And so that's one thing. And the other thing is, is rational agents, right? This, this, in complex systems, agents follow simple rules and they're not rational. And that's very hard also for, for many, many sciences like, like economists. So, um, and, and finally, uh, well, an, an, well, another comment is, um, and I think this is the, the, the major, uh, problem that this conference will have to deal with is, in, in many ways, the idea of complex systems for public policy is a contradiction in terms, right? It, 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 there seems to be some fundamental, uh, um, fundamental contradiction between these things, because public policy, by definition, means I'm going to do something. There's these buttons, there's these levers, and I'm going to push these buttons to reach an objective. And, and the way I understand complex system, it's the first big lesson is that you can't do that. The whole point is that you, you cannot control a, a, a complex system. So you press these buttons, but you don't know if they'll work and they'll, they'll, you'll overshoot and undershoot and, and, and all these things. But, but, but that doesn't mean that there is this fundamental contradiction. I think it's just a matter of expectation of, of, of what you expect that you can achieve in a, in a complex system. So, I'll ask you to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and finally, uh, another, another point also that I, I think is, is important is this, this, with complex systems, there's this notion, whenever anybody hears about it, and, and, and like your presentation was the kind of thing that a, a student or somebody who's never, never um, didn't, didn't know too much about complex systems. They'll see that, and, and, and it, this looks so cool. God, those models and the things. I, I want to do this because this is really so cool. But, but there, in sense, the, it, it's actually good to have some some resistance in the sense that there's a, a danger of hype, right? I think this this literature already already had this problem of hype, where uh, you know this is cool. I want to adopt this, but I'm not really going to. I'm just I'm just going to put it at a, as a new layer onto what I already do. And, and I think uh, that's something that you have to be very careful of, of, of overhyping this thing, and then and then there's a disappointment at the end of what it, what it really can and cannot deliver. So uh, I'll stop here. And yeah, uh, thank you very much, Bill. Would you like to comment? Yeah, I, I just make a couple of quick comments. Uh, so I, I I definitely am not a um, how can I put this. I think there's a there's a hard it's hard to define when complex systems is being used as an analogy. So there's there's let me put it this way: there are ways to use complex systems as an analogy that are poor and weak, right? There are definitely ways to do it that aren't useful, right? But there are other ways to use complex systems as an analogy between areas that can be very very helpful. For instance, uh, some of the great work on scaling laws by Moore and others, right? That, that looking at the fact that you see similar scaling properties within cities, within brains, within people, right? And that that analogy kind of seems to hold up in those different spaces. But it's one where you have to test the analogy, right? We can't just make an analogy and assume 
that based upon that analogy, it's going, you know, because the ants, or sorry, I didn't use the ants model, because the birds look like people, right, that that would be a good way to um, uh, build a model of, of a public policy system, right? Instead, you have to see, can I use some of the concepts like emergence and feedbacks and nonlinearity and sensitivity to initial conditions in ways that I can also use them? So the language is more, the analogy, the complex systems as a language is more what I would push for rather than complex systems as an analogy, right? Describing the system in the same way. Um, my phone lock up. But uh, you also mentioned uh, the lack of equilibrium being scary. And actually, I, I, I feel like I, I should add a chapter, a paragraph or two to the, the introductory chapter about that. I think that I totally agree with that, that the... Um, a lot of times these systems, the one thing we know about the world is that no system is ever in complete equilibrium, right? If it is, it's dead, right? It's not moving anymore. Uh, and so it is very scary that there's no equilibrium in these systems, right? And so you have to, but, but that's one of the lessons, I think, of complex systems is to embrace that and try and figure out how can we continue to manipulate the system? How can we continue to uh, work with the system as it continues to evolve and make changes, right? And that partially that's a product of irrational agents, right? It's the fact that people don't make decisions based upon perfect information. They can't pause, put a pause button on the world and instantly calculate, you know, the exact value price they should be paying for a certain object and the exact one they should choose. Instead, they make these boundedly rational decisions about what they can possibly do within that world and what they can possibly make. And that's, those are two important concepts that I think are currently not in the introductory chapter that I'll definitely make sure is in there in the revised version. That makes a lot of sense to include those. Um, and, and this idea of complex systems is a contradiction to public policy because it's very much something you, the, the lesson of complex systems, and in fact, at the end, you know, I said embrace uncertainty, right? Um, and, but I would point out, you know, Miguel makes a very important point there are ways in which, you know, we can make predictions, right? There are things that we know that complex systems tells us that you should not try because they don't work, right? Um, what I'm, what I, when I say embrace uncertainty, what I mean is that even within the space of the things that we think could possibly work, there is still going to be uncertainty with how those things implement, with how those things are reacted to. But, but one thing complex systems definitely can do that I think is very important is is tell you areas of the world that you should not be looking at for solutions, right? Tell you areas that you can um, examine it. And, and that kind of feeds naturally into this question of hype, right? Which is that there has been um, hype around complex systems. There's been hype around uh, trying to make models that don't necessarily fulfill their dreams and their goals, right? Um, and I think that the best way to kind of address that hype is to continue the educational process, right? A lot of times people see, do see lectures or see talks where they see dynamic models and things unfolding. Um, and they're like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to work with that. Um, and then once they start to learn and they educate, they narrow down what the actual use of it is. And the other thing I would argue is that complex systems is not a replacement, right? Like, it's not like we should take econometric modeling and throw it out the window, right? We should complement traditional forms of modeling with complex systems. So I'm an agent-based modeler myself. And almost all of my best papers, I should say, I won't say all of my papers, but all of my best papers are papers in which we have an agent-based model and an economic model, an agent-based, or sorry, a, a traditional statistical model, right? An agent-based model and a game theory model, an agent-based model and a GIS, a traditional GIS pattern model, right? And so we, we very rarely publish a complex systems approach by itself. It's all grounded in traditional approaches. I think that helps deflate hype because as a result of that, people can say, oh, I understand the simple model and what it, or sorry, the traditional model and what it's doing. Now I can work forward and understand the complex model as well. So those are my quick thoughts on this. All right. Thank you, Bill. This is a very good uh, debate. Very good. Just to add a little bit to uh, Bernard, this is something uh, we should uh, be careful about. I think you bring a good point. I also am very lucky here compared to the audience because I got to see all the chapters, right? <laughs> and then I can see what is going on. Uh, Bernard is going to develop a little bit of this in his chapter, and that helps a lot. Also, as I said earlier, I think that a complex system, uh, they are prob probabilistic. So tomorrow maybe it's even more clear that we can have a, a space of results depending on parameters. And then we can, for example, understanding a tipping point 
or understanding a scaling pattern may help us to know a little bit what, what is, uh, where is the better tweaker and where is important that we pay more attention, even though, of course, we will never be able to perfectly model anything at all. Uh, another thing I listed here, I think it helps a little bit, is, is with the insights. It helps us see a little better what's going on. It helps us understand sustainability and resilience. And also it helps us communicate. As it is, if we could evaluate public policy today in Brazil, they are totally apart, totally isolated. So if we can move one step further into making and communicating a little bit, so I think it is much better. Yeah? So I'd like to, uh, to open questions now if any of uh, the consultants or the people on the team, and then I'll get names. Uh, do you have a microphone? Yeah? Let's have uh, two or three people and then uh, we pass to the table and go once. So uh, we have a gentleman here. Okay. Please uh, say your name and affiliation and the question. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Victor Celestino from the Catholic University of Brasilia. Uh, in order to pose my question, I, I will give a very quick digression. Um, my undergraduation was in aeronautical engineering and my master in quantitative methods. So, Bill, I like very much that you mentioned several times about fly simulation and, <laughs> and how the airlines are, are different. Uh, today, I'm doing my PhD in psychology and I'm studying uh, the behavior of pilots in the airlines and how they make decisions. And, and the idea to go to psychology is really to understand the individual behavior. And uh, I'm trying to m model the uh, psychosocial development with dynamical systems. And uh, so my question would be, well, first of all, I would like to congratulate IPEA and, and all the, the comments that are very, very provoking. And uh, it's really a, p a pleasure and, and an honor to be present here. But the idea is to ask Bill uh, three comments you made. Uh, you, may, you mentioned about small groups, and, and then Miguel mentioned that maybe we could use statistical mechanics for big groups. But uh, uh, the second comment, and this is uh, there is some criticism from Scott Page about using butterfly effect to, to model uh, human behavior. But then you mentioned the weak version. And I think this could be a solution to, to, to go out. And finally, what uh, I'm really interested in, it's about the past dependence uh, module. How can you really module uh, human uh, development? Uh, I'm talking about adult development. Uh, human development with the past dependence. And Scott Page again mentioned three uh, possibilities, the Markov process, the fat dependence, and the past dependence. And I would like you, if you could comment on them. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a gentleman here. Hi. Um, good morning. My name is Lucas Almeida. I'm from, uh, just recently graduated from the University of Brasilia. I'm now at, going to start my master's at the University of Sao Paulo in the program for complex systems. And uh, I'd like to first congratulate IP on the event. And uh, also, to well, it's nice to see Professor Miller, who was one of my teachers at UNB. And uh, I'd like to ask mostly those are very um, questions about the evolution of the discipline of complex systems. And uh, one of the interesting things that I've found when I start to study it is that uh, a lot of the concepts have been around for a while. So there's an article about from Warren Reven when he was in the Rockefeller Foundation talking about the uses of complexity, and it's been there for about 50 years ago. And uh, I think it was used in the complexity MOC at from uh, Santa Fe Institute. And uh, my question would be, why, one of my questions, why has complexity seemed to reach this tipping point since those ideas have been around for a while and why are they now being more, uh, uh, 
being added to the mainstream of science. The other question would be uh, how those uh, former approaches integrate into complexity. For example, the, the kybernetics approach from Wiener. Uh, are, are these being integrated? Or do you see them as, as a part of the complexity framework now, or are they a, a parallel de development? And um, my, my last question is more of a, um, uh, about the discipline. Do you believe that complexity could be a field in itself, or will it always be added to other fields of study, or can it develop its own curriculum, its own subject matter, become it, its uh, a certain branch of science? And thank you very much. Thank you, Lucas. I, I will add a question of myself, and then I'd like to use a little bit more of Miguel's time. Uh, Miguel is interested in methodology, but also in concepts, right? So, Miguel, if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on education. I've heard a lot about Melanie Mitchell, and she's doing an effort to put together what is complex system. So, from an epistemological uh, point of view, uh, because we have this list of concepts, if you could talk uh, a little bit of two, and then I'll go to Rand and then come back to you. Bill, please. Oh, okay. Um, yes. Um, so, you know, starting with the, the first set of questions, right, I, I do think that there is this um, trade-off between uh, small group understandings, right, and larger group understandings. I think there are some approaches that can work in both contexts. As I mentioned, you know, the, the, I kind of rushed through that part of my talk a little bit, but I believe actually that the real power of complex systems comes when a concentrated group of individuals who can be modeled uh, within the complex systems framework have a dramatic effect on the results, right? So it's not when, like, the individual group within that space um, makes arbitrary decisions. So the example I always kind of point up is you don't really want to use complex systems to model how Kim Jong-il was going to affect the world, right? That's not a very useful way to think of things because he acts in very kind or acted in very kind of irrational ways, right? Instead, it's when there's a group of individuals, maybe thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who can dramatically change things, right, within the system. And this this is kind of similar to the statistical mechanics approach that often tries to classify out different different parts of the system in different ways in order to understand the interaction of those parts with the other with the, the overall system. So I don't know if those are necessarily a contradiction with each other. I think they're similar to each other. It's just a matter of how you define the space you're looking at it in. Um, I also um, I also do believe that right that, that a lot of times you can't just start at an arbitrary initial condition that you're starting at the condition that you are given right and this is something Miguel points out as well and so as a result that you are sensitive to that condition now that's not the same as the butterfly effect right that's different than the the, the strong form of the butterfly effect and its effect on chaos theory but I think it's something we do have to keep in mind when thinking about um, public policy and, and complex systems, right? Is where is the current state of policy, right? Where is the world and where we are, and how will small changes or even dramatic changes change the system that we're in, right? Um, as opposed to just assuming an ideal world. Um, and we, and actually the, the slide I showed on path dependence, by the way, it's interesting you mentioned Scott Page's name because that was actually, him, he was on that paper as well that I was using as an illustration for that. Um, and uh, we do believe that there are some methods. In fact, that paper is all about how can you isolate path dependence? How can you figure out when it's occurring? How can you then alter the system? And when can you possibly do it? And I think that that's a matter of combining kind of complex systems, sorry, path dependence analysis with leverage point analysis to find out what's going on there. Um, I, uh, just one quick comment to answer your question. I do believe the discipline has been uh, evolving quite a bit, right? Um, and I think we, I don't know if I would say we're at a tipping point right now, but I do believe that there has been more um, uh, a publicity given to complex systems recently. And I believe that a lot of that is because the problems that we've witnessed have been best solved and best understood through complex systems, right? So, you know, the Great Recession, for instance, that recently occurred was something that, you know, a lot of models out there, people were claiming, uh, Traditional, statistics, traditional econometric models weren't good at predicting what was going on in, right? Whereas if you use a complex systems approach, it provides you new and better insight into what's going on. 
As we, I would argue that there's two reasons why complex systems continues to be, it will continue to be useful in the future. One, that um, one of the things about complex systems that does require knowledge about all this interconnectedness and what's going on within it. And that requires the ability to build models that have lots of interconnected parts. And that's something that we've only recently developed and only recently had the computational hardware to really be able to do. And the second thing is that as we solve the easy problems, right, the complex problems are the only ones that are left, right? And so it's understanding those complex problems that really will continue to progress as we go forward. I'm very in favor of the educational efforts happening in this space. I hope it continues to progress. We've tried to do that in our own space. I think Melanie's doing a great job with the MOOC, particularly the Massway Online Open Course. Um, and I hope she continues to do that for sure. So, yeah. The book. yeah, yeah, the in the book. book. Well, I, I will make some comments. I thank you for this opportunity, actually, to expand myself. Um, and actually, I will say something that is very you know, is, uh, you mentioned or you have the sense that complexity now is, you know, in his top or something like that. Yeah. But, you know, uh, I think, I will not say the opposite, but I will say that some people is thinking what we do next in complex system, meaning that uh, I think the people and, and, and the, the person that is doing this type of science uh, the, they are trying to ask themselves, well, we have this amount of knowledge and we have this method methodology, what we can do next? Uh, there is a sense of a stationary state where, you know, we talk about agent-based simulation, non-linearity, uh, many particle interaction with simple rules, and what's next, you see? I, and I think uh, there is a critique in, in the complex system kind of uh, community uh, trying to see what is the next step? What is the next step? Uh, what, what is the next generation of complex system scientists? Uh, I'm very sure, I think, I mean, that the next complex system kind of scientist will not be like me, for example, saying, I'm coming from statistical mechanics. The next one will say I'm coming from complex system yeah. kind of uh, yeah. uh, branch of science, which means that probably we'll have a, 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 an, un an undergraduate uh, kind of uh, university course that is more integrate. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that this will be the next step on, on complex system science. Uh, which is now, I think, a, bra a branch of science, but it still is kind of, um, you can see that there are borders, you see? You can see that this guy is doing, uh, for example, uh, evo evolutionary biology, but he's doing complex system, but evolutionary biology with something. Or this guy is doing anthropology with something, with the help of, you know, physicists and and there is no this type of cohesion that I would like to see in a uh, complex system scientist. Like, you know, uh, trying to... Now we are trying to communicate still in different language. We have a, a, a common language for sure, but still you can see some, you know, kind of borders, kind of borders in some, some scientists. And, and I think this border will disappear with time. Um, and also... Uh, there is this sense in some part of the community that is trying to reach uh, the primary school and also secondary school in this uh, in new in a new agenda in a new type of, of uh, education which is more integral and a more kind of integral education uh, trying to, you know, going out this box of uh, mathematics per se or uh, uh, biology per se or whatever, you know, and trying to do or build a kind of a curriculum that's more integrated uh, between different disciplines. Uh, I think this is happening in the United States but also in, in another part in the world. Uh, also in Argentina, where I came from. Um, what else? 
Oh, yeah, the, the epistemological thing of, of uh, complex uh, system science. Uh, that is something that uh, we were talking with some uh, researchers actually, you know, trying to build this idea of what is a complex complexity or what or what is the meaning of uh, of a given complexity of an ob object or uh, a phenomena and there are a few things out there actually I will talk tomorrow about that uh, but also I would like to mention in this direction that I think complexity is, is uh, if it's not the f probably is the first branch of science that uh, in order to be defined it needs another branch of the knowledge that are not scientific. And I think that is a very peculiar characteristic of complex system science. Uh, uh, and it makes a huge difference between other type of science uh, in, uh, in an epistemological uh, view. Uh, but um, uh, something that might be useful uh, for, for people who are here about complexity uh, for the first time, and I think in, in general, is this idea, what, when we talk about complex system, we have all these definitions of all these properties of what a complex system is, but then, um, and, and, and it's very data driven and we want to quantify things, but so, so how can you measure complex systems, right? This idea of finding measures, measures for them. And it, tur it turns out that there are actually a whole bunch of measures, very different measures depending where what, what you're looking at. Do you think that there, maybe you could talk a little bit about that, but then also uh, something that I, I always wondered, is, is, is this going to be refined at some point? Is there, is there going to come, at some point, are the people going to be able to come up? Because this is something very, it would be very useful to have a measure, a quantifiable measure that you could look at any system you want and then you could put a number to it. Right. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I kind of, in general, I think that there, I, I think I kind of very much agree with Miguel. I think there are really two uses of complex systems right now. One is as a field by itself, right, studying how to refine it, how to become better and better. But the other is a complement to other fields, right, There's these border areas that Miguel talks about, right, complex systems analysis of biology, complex systems analysis of public policy, right. Um, and I don't, I don't think the answer has to be that complex systems has to be one or the other. I think it can be both, right. It can be a field by itself and it can be a complement to other fields. Um, you know, the analogy I often draw is statistics, right? Statistics is a field. People study statistics by itself. They study what statistics is about. But then there's also applied statistics. That's how do you take statistics and apply it to problem X, Y, or Z and understand what's going on in that space, right? And I very much feel that um, complex systems is similar in some ways, but hopefully eventually going beyond that because I also feel complex systems has the language to move beyond that. I do believe complex systems can be continued to be refined to become hard, and in fact it has been, right? I mean, there are definitely different measures and different knowledge that we have before, right? Um, there used to be much, I, you know, was doing my, I did a certificate in complex system study as a graduate student at the University of Michigan, and I believe we now have kind of come to understand better what do we mean when we say emergence, what do we mean when we say um, uh, non-linearity, right? Um, what do we mean when we say sensitivity to initial conditions that we did back then? And there are very specific kind of models of this space that are currently being debated, right? So for instance, I work a lot with a framework called computational mechanics that was developed uh, by Jim Crutchfield and his colleagues at the Santa Fe Institute, right? Um, and this method allows you to infer a, the the complexity of, a, of any kind of given time series of data, right? And kind of understand how complex is this time series. And it has a nice set of properties that intuitively match to your intuitions. It says the system is not very complex if you can exactly, if it's exactly deterministic, right, in many ways. And it's not very complex if it's completely random. But in fact, complexity happens at the mid-range when there's some pattern of behavior that's predictable within the system. 
And this can then be used in Cosmos Shalisi, one of Jim's students went on to do this, to do things like measure how self-organized is the system, right? So you can actually put a number on the, on the how well that system organizes as a group to come together uh, to produ produce co more and more complex behavior. And so I, I, I firmly believe these will continue to be refined and updated and continue to be adjusted. And that, you know, the textbooks of complex systems, when, you know, Melanie's being a great introduction for sure, um, 10, 20 years from now will be very different than the complex systems textbooks that we have today, for sure. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Bill. Uh, do you have any more questions from the audience? Yes, one over there. James, did you raise your hand? No, sure. <laughs> OK, please. Uh, my name is Juan Silva. I'm from Planning and Budget Ministry. And I'm taking IPEA master's degree in public policy and development. Uh, first of all, congratulations to IPEA. A pleasure to meet Bernard again 20 years ago. <laughs> OK, uh, last year in June, we have some social events, movements in Brazil. They were very important. But before that, in Arabic countries, we have the same, similar movements. So can complex systems understood this kind of social phenomena? You are talking about the thing that happened in Sao Paulo, for example? No. What? Yeah? Um, yeah, I mean, so complex systems has definitely been used in the past to study social movements. That's definitely the case. Um, uh, both uh, within, and I should say, you know, Brazil would be an example of a more open regime, right, where it's happening. It's also been used within closed regimes as well to study what's going on, for instance, in North Korea and things like that in order to understand some of the things happening in those spaces. Um, uh, and, and these models have taken on a number of different forms from exploring what, how, what the, uh, uh, there's a very interesting model by Josh Epstein and Michael Steinbrunner, for instance, at the University of Maryland, and Josh is now at uh, Johns Hopkins, looking at uh, civil unrest, for instance, and trying to understand how does that happen, how do rebellions occur within systems, and how do agencies, tra how do govern societies transition within systems. Um, I also think that, you know, social movements, one of the interesting things about this, and this actually gets back to my undergraduate dissertation, um, is that a lot of them are premised on the ability of communication, right? About the ability to communicate thoughts and ideas between individuals on what's going on. Um, and my actual undergraduate thesis was on how to use what I called high-speed communication, which at the time basically was email, uh, to transmit information between individuals, right? And how that could help move towards more democratic societies, right? And that really was, in many ways, I was taking a complex systems framework in that space, right? Trying to understand how could you see transitions within that. We've recently been using uh, Twitter data uh, to look at things like uh, some of the Arab Spring events, right, for instance, and try and understand how did individuals communicate. One of the kind of interesting things I, ha I have in the space, and obviously in Sao Paulo, right, you had a lot of actual um, physical action. You had people actually moving from communication of ideas to action, right? And that's something I'm very interested in studying, and I think complex systems can provide a good framework for understanding, you know, if you have a bunch of Twitter, right, a bunch of tweets going out about a social movement, at what point do I make the decision, I'm really upset about this, I'm going to go out and change the world because of it, right? Or does social media and communication provide me a way to vent my frustration, and as a result, I stay in my house and don't go outside and get upset about it, right? One thing I've always admired about uh, Brazilian society is you're very passionate about your politics and are very passionate about your, 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 your civil society. And I think that that, so I think as a result, we have different frameworks that might be useful in different countries. It'd be interesting to explore how do social movements arise in Brazil versus, you know, the, you know, potentially something like the Occupy Wall Street movement in the United States, right? And what, do, what are the contrasts and comparisons between those? I think complex systems is one of the few frameworks that might give you a language by which you could actually compare across very different societies in that way. 
I, I will add only that yeah, one of the methodologies of complex system is data mining. Um, that is exa exactly what William was referring to, no? this Twitter thing and, and all this communication that now, nowadays we can collect and we can study and we can see patterns. This is actually data mining. Data mining is not taking the data but uh, finding the pattern in, the, in this huge data. Um, for sure, probably the answer to your question will be probably with one percent, I mean, complex system or whatever thing will not tell you in a very deterministic way that this will happen. But I can argue that we will give you some very good, you know, idea that there is something going on in, in you know, in all this communication and you will have, for example, in a, in a network of, of Twitter, uh, in what is called out, you know, a, a cloud of words, you will see, for example, let's go to the street, you know. You will see this pattern all over, I mean, one day, another day, another day. And, I mean, and if you are a, a, a policy maker, probably you will say, you know, something, something is going on. And this is only one methodology and is uh, about the collection of, uh, the collection of data and see, seeing what's happening in the data, but there is no mechanism involved. You see, there is no a model, that, I mean, there is no something that, there is no uh, an, uh, dynamical equation for that. Even though complex system has these tools, you know, you can have this tool and, and you can see what happened, and then probably next, I mean, the next step is build a model and build a, a, a dynamical, equation, dynamical model to, to observe what is happening. And for sure this is cultural. I mean, you will have a, a, a Twitter kind of pattern in Sao Paulo and you will see another very different Twitter I can, I can you know, guarantee you in Switzerland or in Tokyo, for example. You will not see the same, you will not see the same kind of, you know, or uh, even emotional. Occupy Wall Street, right? Or even Occupy Wall Street or something yeah. like that, even within the same context, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, you can use the tools of complex system. You can see that something will happen with some probability. Uh, and this is something that you can, I mean, for sure use. But the answer will not, will be 100% sure, you know. But, but for sure there is something to say. Okay. okay. I believe we still have some questions. Yes, here. Yeah, my question is a bit theoretical or methodological. Um, I'm wondering if everything is interconnected and if interactions matter a lot, how do we define the boundaries of a complex system, of, of, this, of the system under analysis? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, in fact, uh, one of John Howland's most previous book before this was a book called Signals and Boundaries that was exactly on kind of this question about understanding where do you put those boundaries around complex systems. Um, I, I think it's interesting. I think that a lot of times, so I'm going to take the perspective from a modeler, right? And from a modeler, someone, when I go to approach a problem, where do I draw that boundary since everything's interconnected? And I think one of the lessons that we've learned from complex systems is that if you try to start by putting everything into the model, you're doomed to failure from the beginning, right? So if you try and not draw the boundary, right, and try and just assume I'm going to include all the interactions, right, that you're never going to get your model up and running. It's never going to be useful. Instead, the solution is to start by putting the boundary around what's the minimal amount of things that I think I need to account for in order to observe the phenomenon that I'm trying to describe. And that actually is a rough paraphrase of an Einstein quote. That's not me saying that, right? Where he basically says, build your models as simple as possible, but no simpler, right? And so I would argue, I don't know if I have a clear answer. I mean, I can't say draw the boundary here, but it should be as tight as possible to address the question that you're trying to address, right? And no, and no tighter. And no bigger either, right? Um, that would be the one piece of advice I would get. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if you have any final words or. Yeah? yeah? No? So I'd like to thank again very much Bill for coming all the way, Bernard and Miguel for fake it, making the comments. I'd like to thank all the people watching us on the online at Switzerland and uh, Japan. 
And uh, of course, this was just the first morning. We have at 2 p.m. We are going to have uh, Luis Bittencourt talking about cities, then debate. Then we're going to have transportation, Dick, at uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon. So you're all invited. And then we continue tomorrow at 10. So we'll convene again at 2. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm glad you made that reference. I, yeah. I should have thought of that when I was... <laughs>